Hello, everyone. Uh, we are so thrilled that you have joined us for this webinar or this birthday party of sorts for Family Planning Elevated. We've had a very busy year and we're excited to share some highlights and some hiccups with you. So the idea for today is to share with you what we've been up to and what we've learned in our inaugural year of this program. By sharing what worked and what didn't and what surprises we encountered along the way, we're hoping to give you a sense of not only how things are going, but what it actually takes to deliver a contraceptive initiative like ours. The FPE team will use the first hour to provide an overview of what happened during the first year of our statewide contraceptive initiative. And then we're gonna open up the second hour to you so that you can ask any questions that we didn't answer. Family Planning Elevated is our statewide contraceptive initiative in Utah. The goal of our initiative is to increase access to high quality, person-centered, comprehensive family planning services in Utah. We also subsidize the costs of contraceptive care for uninsured, underinsured, and undocumented Utahns so they can get whatever method they want without economic or geographic barriers. Family Planning Elevated is housed in the Family Planning Division of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. Our team comprises clinicians, researchers, and staff who provide contraception and abortion care and who conduct clinical trials and participate in the development of new contraceptive methods. We're a family planning fellowship site and we are the people behind two community level contraceptive initiatives, Her Salt Lake and now Family Planning Elevated. We're the experts in family planning in Utah. I want to introduce you to each member of our team so you can put a face to a name and learn more about our different roles if you wanna connect with one of us about a specific aspect of FPE. We hope these introductions will help direct you to the best contact. My name's Kyle Myers. I'm the Program Director of Family Planning Elevated. I handle the day-to-day -day operations of FPE, and I oversee the program contracts and budgets, community and donor relations, and communication strategy. Dr. David Turok is FPE's Medical Director and the Family Planning Division Chief. Dave is an OBGYN and a renowned expert in family planning care. He oversees the medical technical support and training we offer our partners. Dr. Rebecca Simmons is FPE's evaluation director. Rebecca designed the evaluation plan for Family Planning Elevated and supervises ongoing evaluation, data collection, and analysis for the program. Dr. Jessica Sanders is FPE's research and policy advisor. Jess was instrumental in the passage of Utah's Medicaid Family Planning Waiver in 2018 and oversees the evaluation of family planning policies in Utah. Dr. Jessica Lewis Caprell is the clinical training specialist for FPE. Dr. Lewis Caprell is our lead trainer for IUD and implant provision, as well as all other contraceptive method education. She travels across the state visiting FPE partner clinics and providing proctoring support to help clinicians become competent in comprehensive contraceptive provision. Caitlin Quaid is the Family Planning Elevated Contraceptive Access Program Manager. Caitlin oversees all aspects of FPE CAP from contracts, onboarding, program compliance, and troubleshooting. She's also an expert educator and conducts person-centered contraceptive counseling trainings for the FPE CAP providers and staff. Alex Juro is a research associate with Family Planning Elevated. Alex manages the collection and analysis of service delivery data from FPE CAP partners, in addition to the analysis of other FPE activities, such as the Contraceptive Education and Training Conference and state level surveillance data. Jamie Bade is a research associate for Family Planning Elevated. As the process evaluator, Jamie collects detailed data on FPE's implementation process, as well as tracks the ever-changing context in which FPE operates. Together with Caitlin and the Lyft Simulation Design Lab, Jamie is creating a family planning simulation training program for FPE. Maddie Mulholland is FPE's project facilitator. Maddie is responsible for the administration of FPE activities. She assists FPE CAP partners in getting reimbursed for providing contraceptive care, manages communication between our vendors, and handles the operations of the Reproductive Justice Community Advisory Board and FPE's internship program. The successful operation of an, of an initiative of this scope and scale requires an accomplished team with a diverse set of skills. While we come from a range of backgrounds, our team is guided by shared values. 
and fundamental to our team are the values of flexibility and transparency. As you will see during this webinar, we have had to pivot and adapt to factors that are out of our control. But what I hope you will also see is our unwavering commitment to our founding values, that all people deserve equitable access to all contraceptive methods at all times and in all communities, which turns out is a lot more complicated than it sounds. So grab your piece of cake and allow us to take you on a little trip through FPE's first year. First, we want to make sure that you know how FPE came to fruition. It's important that you know that Family Planning Elevated is not our first initiative. In 2016, we partnered with Planned Parenthood Association of Utah to provide no-cost contraceptive care in four of their Salt Lake County health centers for one year. This was the Her Salt Lake Contraceptive Initiative. Between March of 2016 and March of 2017, we served 7,402 individuals and 4,425 of the clients served enrolled in a longitudinal study assessing the outcomes of getting this no-cost contraception. Data from Her Salt Lake were used to demonstrate the need for increased contraceptive coverage during the 2018 Utah State Legislative Session and helped in the passage of a Medicaid Family Planning Waiver that would go into effect on January 1, 2019 and expand contraceptive coverage to around 50,000 Utahns. This was a step in the right direction, but our team identified two gaps. First, partial Medicaid expansion was creating demand, but no one was focusing on the supply. Medicaid expansion is great, however, without an implementation strategy, supporting clinics and building capacity and receiving training to provide contraceptive care to an increasing number of insured clients, improved contraceptive access was more theoretical than actual. Additionally, many federally qualified health centers did not offer IUDs or implants and their providers weren't trained because their uninsured and undocumented clients couldn't afford these methods. County health departments also weren't providing comprehensive contraception. Further, there were many folks who did not benefit from Medicaid expansion, including individuals who earned incomes that made them ineligible for Medicaid and undocumented Utahns. These populations needed access to contraception as well. There was a clear need for a statewide contraceptive initiative. Her Salt Lake ended in March, 2017. In an effort to create a statewide and sustainable contraceptive initiative, we applied for a Pay for Success Feasibility Grant through the Sorensen Impact Center. We were selected as an awardee, and the grant funded a planning year from July 2017 to June 2018, which is what we needed to meet with stakeholders, identify solutions, design family planning elevated, and seek funding. Part of that planning year was spent designing our evaluation. As our team has moved through Her Salt Lake and into FPE, we've used our own research findings to guide our decision making on what sorts of outcomes and change we are actually trying to achieve. For example, research done on pregnancy intention through Her Salt Lake demonstrated that for many people, pregnancy intentions are fluid and can change quickly relative to life circumstances. This and discussions about unintended pregnancy as an outcome has led us to move away from using unintended pregnancy as a primary outcome for FPE. Our evaluation approach has been shaped by our previous work and the ways that we planned to collect FPE data have also been shaped by the data sources we've already developed. FPE is collecting data that supplements our existing resources. During the planning year, we also published the first paper from the Her Salt Lake Contraceptive Initiative in the American Journal of Public Health. The paper caught the attention of Arnold Ventures and they became the first funder for FPE. We were fortunate to receive grants from two other family foundations and had the funding we needed to hire personnel and get started. By October of 2018, FPE had hired and onboarded nearly every member of the team. We immediately got to work drafting a request for applications for our flagship, flagship program, the Family Planning Elevated Contraceptive Access Program, or FPE CAP. 
FBE CAP provides health centers in Utah with robust financial and technical support during their two-year membership to either start or expand contraceptive care in their clinical practice. For the benefit of those joining us today who aren't quite as familiar with the program, I'm going to pause here and, and dive into the details of what FPE CAP offers. First, we provide a cash grant of up to $100,000 to purchase med medical equipment and supplies related to contraceptive care and to supplement personnel costs. Sites receive training and proctoring on clinical skills, as well as technical assistance on logistical aspects of family planning service delivery, like stocking, billing, and coding. We reimburse clinics each month for contraceptive services and prescription methods they've provided to eligible clients. And for FPE cap's sake, eligible clients are those who are uninsured, underinsured, who don't qualify for Medicaid and have a household income below 250% federal poverty level. In this way, FPE essentially acts as a payer, reimbursing clinics for contraceptive counseling methods and procedures for those eligible clients. While we provide reimbursement for some methods, the rest we stock directly at the, at the clinics. These include IUDs, implants, barrier methods, and additional supplies. Another offering is our marketing campaign to raise awareness about medical eligibility, as well as FPE CAP, and drive demand for contraceptive services at FPE CAP sites. And you'll be hearing more about that later. Lastly, we support FPE CAP sites to collect and report family planning service delivery data and client exit surveys, data that we're able to analyze here and present back to sites for their own use. So who was eligible for FBE CAP? Well, we sought applications from Utah health centers serving patients in the contraceptive coverage gap. Those who are uninsured, underinsured, and undocumented of uh, patients of reproductive age. But we also required applicants to serve Medicaid covered patients. At this point, we really didn't know enough about the federal 340B drug pricing program to know just how essential it would be for sites to access those deeply discounted prices. And 340B eligibility ended up being something we'd require of cohort two and, and three clinics in a, later application rounds. For those first three spots in cohort one of FPE CAP, we received eight applications. And those applications gave us a snapshot of clinics patient populations, their capacity to provide family planning, their clinical and technical training needs, their plans for using the cash grant, and their ability to provide the service delivery data that we need for our evaluation. In early December 2018, we selected our first three organizations and spent the following weeks, and let's be honest, months, drafting subcontracts. During that fall of 2018, we were also busy planning our first annual contraceptive education and training conference to be hosted on January 18th of 2019. Our goal was to train all the providers, staff, and administrators who made up our first cohort of FPE clinics and to introduce FPE to the larger community. At the same time, we were working to identify a partner for our statewide media campaign to raise awareness about Medicaid expansion, provide education about fertility and contraception, and to link Utahns to FPE CAP sites across the state. We issued a request for proposals from media agencies, and we selected a local agency, BWP Communications, in December. We were also working on our pharmacy partnerships. We had contracts with Cooper Surgical and Merck, and we were looking, for, we were looking forward to receiving Paragard and Nexplanon devices soon. Clinical Innovations generously donated uterine sounds to the project. Medicaid expansion, not so fast. All fall, we'd been preparing for FPE CAP to launch on January 1st, 2019, coinciding with the Medicaid Family Planning Waiver, also slated to begin January 1st. Then, in November of 2018, Utahns voted on a ballot initiative to fully expand Medicaid to 138% federal poverty level starting April 1st, 2019. It passed, and we were ecstatic. Nevertheless, we started hearing chatter that we might not want to get our hopes up that everything was going to go according to plan. Indeed, because of the ballot initiative passing, the State Medicaid Office and Department of Workforce, Workforce Services were not working on implementing the Medicaid Family Planning Waiver on January 1st. 
Instead, they were focused on implementing full Medicaid expansion on April 1st. After all, the people who would have benefited from the waiver would also benefit from the full expansion. So FPE had to adapt. We decided that cohort one would start in February rather than January, and that our plan for FPE to cover people between 101 to 250% federal poverty level would have to change as well. We would start by filling the gap that the waiver was supposed to fill and cover contraceptive services for clients with incomes below 100% federal poverty level until Medicaid expansion took effect in April. The winter of 2019 was a busy time, marking the official launch of FPE, enrollment of cohort one FPE cap clinics, the establishment of the Utah Reproductive Justice Community Advisory Board, and our first annual contraceptive education and training conference. On January 18th, we hosted our first contraceptive education and training conference. There were 64 attendees, 42 providers, and 22 staff and administrators. In many ways, CETC was a success. The conference was well attended, and based on our longitudinal evaluation of attendees, those who attended improved their knowledge and understanding around provision of contraceptive care. In other ways, the conference was a miss. Not all FPE CAP sites were able to send their entire teams for training. We learned this was primarily because the clinics could not afford to close for a day. We also learned that although the conference was important and useful for training those who were able to attend, it was not the best way to train our newly onboarded FPE CAP teams. We adapted and decided the best way for our training to reach each clinic was for our FPE team to visit every health center and conduct on-site training. With that learning in mind, FPE began conducting onboarding with each of our three sites. We also scheduled LARC training and data support meetings with cohort one. We became more responsive to the unique needs of the sites. That didn't mean that everything went perfectly. Drafting the contracts with each of the clinics began, but the process moved quite slowly and took almost two months to fully execute. The contracts for each clinic were complex and unique. Our reimbursement structure mirrored Medicaid rates for services and procedures like contraceptive counseling and IUD and implant removal and insertion, but prices for short acting methods varied by clinic based on whether they had an <coughs> on-site pharmacy, how they were procuring methods, and if they had access to low cost drugs through the federal 340B drug pricing program. We also had some challenges with inventory donations. Our Paragard and Explanon donations hadn't arrived yet, so we had to reimburse clinics until those shipments came in. Our Paragard shipment arrived in February and Nexplanon arrived in July. There were also some challenges with the Medicaid delay. We received official notice that the Medicaid family planning waiver would not go into effect. This meant that while we waited for Medicaid, FPE acted as the Medicaid family planning waiver covering eligible Utahns between zero and 100% federal poverty level with no cost contraceptive care from February 1st until April 1st. Our clinics would have to change their eligibility again shortly after they started the program, but everyone agreed that it was important to start providing coverage even with this challenge. With all of these external factors in flux, we hoped that monthly service delivery data collection would run more smoothly than the Medicaid changes, but in this, our hopes were also dashed. After looking at the pilot data, we realized that the, that the way electronic health records are set up, we wouldn't be able to utilize our planned data collection process to obtain our primary outcomes. This led to many discussions with EHR experts and consultants on how to acquire the right data and ultimately led us to completely change our approach to data collection. Our Reproductive Justice Community Advisory Board put the win in winter for our program. Over the course of several months, members of the FPE team met with reproductive justice organizers and leaders in Utah to discuss and establish the RJCAB. We held an open house in February, advertised widely in English and Spanish, and invited community members to attend to learn more about FPE and consider applying to be a board member. The objective of the RJCAB is to fund a board of grassroots RJ leaders that could advise FPE on our program activities, 
but also create a formalized way that FPE could support the work of the community members, which included leaders of the Utah Abortion Fund and doulas of color, for example. 20 community members applied and we selected all 20 as our inaugural 2019 RJCAB. We selected two co-chairs from the applications so that RJCAB would be led by trusted RJ community leaders. We determined our schedule based on member availability and preference, which resulted in two hour meetings on a Saturday afternoon every other month. FPE pays for this space at a community center in Salt Lake, caters lunch, offers childcare and transportation support, and provides compensation for RJCAB members in the form of gift cards. In the first year, we focused on creating a space where members felt, spa felt safe and heard and could discuss issues that were important to them. And we prioritized building relationships and trust with our members. The end of winter saw things starting to stabilize on the policy front. On the last day of the 2019 ses legislative session, a number of amendments were made to the voter approved ballot measure, which altered the Medicaid program that ultimately went into effect. These amendments lowered Medicaid eligibility from the voter approved 138% to the legislature approved 100% federal poverty level, added work requirements and per capita caps, and was not compliant with the Center for Medicaid Services. Ultimately, the Utah legislature needed to sort out these amendments with the federal government and proposed several backup waiver plans in the event that the federal government didn't approve. On March 29, 2019, the Center for Medicaid Services gave Utah the green light to launch partial Medicaid expansion up to 100% federal poverty level on April 1st. The office was abuzz with activity during the springtime. We issued a second RFA for cohort two in May and we hired a new team member, Jamie, to manage the process evaluation. We tabled at a number of local health conferences to spread the word about FPE cap and make connections. And we reconvened the planning committee to start mapping out our second annual contraceptive education and training conference to be held in summer 2020. On the FPE cap side, we were rolling with the recent policy changes. For the month of April, FPE continued to cover individuals under 100% FPL while clinics began helping patients enroll in Medicaid, but we also increased our upper eligibility limit to 250% FPL. Finally, on May 1st, we settled into our originally intended FPE cap coverage range, 101 to 250% FPL for uninsured and underinsured clients, and zero to 250% FPL for undocumented clients. Throughout the spring, Dr. Lewis Caprell traveled to FPE cap sites to train and proctor providers. Clinics were getting a lot of information on LARC provision and general contraceptive care. In the meantime, we were learning a lot as well. Our original plan, tasking a partner organization to act as our clearinghouse for billing and reimbursement, didn't pan out. And as a result, FPE staff buckled down and took on the process. As FPE cap grew, so did the monthly service delivery data reports and reimbursement claims. It quickly became clear that the mountain of data and invoices we were receiving, we would need to have an automated system. We turned to a data systems company, a SEMIO, to conduct a user story mapping session with our team to strategize how to ha handle this influx of data. As the summer heat wave rolled in, so did applications for our second and third cohorts for FPE CAP. We received applications from five organizations from which we selected three for cohort two and two for cohort three. Of note, two county health departments were accepted into this incoming class, expanding the structural diversity of sites within FPE. To this point, we were reimbursing clinics for the Liletta IUD at the 340B rate of $50. The dawning realization that FPE might serve more patients than originally anticipated led us to explore options for stocking additional hormonal IUDs in the program. Over the summer, we submitted an investigator-initiated study application to Beer for Morena, Kylina, and Skyla IUDs. And as a side note, our contract was finalized 
for this in January of 2020. And we look forward to receiving our first shipment soon. And then nearly after five months of reimbursing clinics for Nexplanon devices, our first shipment of implants finally arrived in July. Our cohort two clinics were very passionate about providing vasectomy services. And in the spirit of our program's mission, we added vasectomy to the list of FPE, FPE cap covered services. We were also engaging in national family planning initiatives and conversations during this time. The National Institute for Reproductive Health paid Salt Lake City a visit in July and partnered with us to host a local policy advocacy event. Participants were able to interact and strategize with local policymakers on developing policies, protecting sexual and reproductive health care rights. Our clinical team also helped host a postpartum IUD training in St. George in partnership with ACOG's Postpartum Contraceptive Access Initiative, or PACAI. Additionally, Kyle was invited to present on FPE at the Contraceptive Access Conference in New Orleans, where we con uh, connected with many other US-based initiatives. Dr. Sanders stayed busy on the Hill and went to Medicaid Advisory Committee interim meetings once a month. She was approached by Utah State Senator Derek Kitchen, who wanted to sponsor a bill for a family planning Medicaid waiver up to 250% of the federal poverty level. Keep your eyes peeled for the waiver, Senate Bill 74, this upcoming legislative session. By the end of the summer, we were in full swing piloting client exit surveys and onboarding our cohort two sites. We changed our approach this time around, traveling to individual clinics to meet staff, provide an orientation to the project, and later to facilitate IUD and implant trainings and proctoring. On the data front, Dr. Simmons proposed and defended contraceptive access questions to be included for the 2020 Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey. Our team had initially proposed and defended these questions for inclusion in the 2019 survey, but each year requires advocating for their inclusion in this statewide survey. The inclusion of these questions represented a win for our state in further understanding contraceptive access barriers. Our celebratory spirit was short-lived as the domestic gag rule knocked on Title X's door in August. The implementation of the rule prohibiting abortion referral forced Planned Parenthood to withdraw from receiving Title X funds, leaving Utah without a Title X grantee. Planned Parenthood Association of Utah did not let the gag rule deter them from providing comprehensive contraceptive care to their patients. They remain an influential and critical medical home for thousands of Utahns who fall in the contraceptive coverage gap. FPE is committed to helping our state address the ongoing loss of Title X funds. As we work to finalize contracts with cohort two clinics in September, we received some more disappointing news. The pharmacy contract on which several of our clinics relied was not able to accommodate contraceptive prescriptions through FPE. This meant clinics that did not have an on-site pharmacy or an established pharmacy partnership couldn't offer short acting methods at no cost and thus would not be able to launch FPE. We needed a new approach. It just so happens that in the middle of all this hand-wringing season, the Utah Board of Pharmacy was getting ready to propose a rule change, one which would allow licensed clinics and providers to dispense prepackaged drugs, including hormonal contraception, in clinic, eliminating the need for, off for an off-site pharmacy visit. The rule proposal was filed in late September, and we watched and waited to see how it would play out. In fall 2019, we finally hit our stride. In October, we continued onboarding cohort two and three members, and we kicked off our person-centered contraceptive counseling training series. Caitlin showed up to FPE CAP sites, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed at 7 a.m. to share her expertise and teach providers new techniques. Though we'd always offered reimbursement for these methods, we felt it was important to begin stocking less popular contraceptives 
to ensure same day access and thus began ordering sponges, spermicide, diaphragms, cervical caps, and app-based fertility awareness methods, such as the FDA-approved Natural Cycles app. In November, we received the good news that the in-clinic dispensing rule officially passed, which meant we could give the green light to clinics that were waiting on a pharmacy solution. We started the process of determining a protocol for on-site dispensing for these clinics. One of the things that we've learned as we've provided training over the spring and summer was that we wanted a more holistic and comprehensive approach to clinic training. We began piloting clinic-based simulation scenarios to train all clinical staff on family planning care. In closing out 2019, FPE hit the conference trail. Dr. Simmons presented at the Society of Family Planning annual meeting as a top four oral abstract on the contraceptive journey, advocating for supporting clients in choosing whatever method they want and switching and discontinuing, and discontinuing as often as they want. We also sponsored five RJ CAB members to travel to the Society of Family Planning meeting in Los Angeles and the Sister Songs Let's, Let's Talk About Sex conference in Atlanta. Dr. Myers presented on FPE at the American Public Health Association annual conference in Philadelphia and the National Family Planning and Reproductive Health Association seasonal conference in Dallas. And we thought all was quiet on the Medicaid front until the state Medicaid office gave us Christmas miracle by announcing that Medicaid would be expanding to 138% federal poverty level on January 1st, 2020, thus fulfilling the initial coverage proposed by voters back in November of 2018. So this was a huge win for our state. We continued to work in the policy trenches and had ongoing communications with policymakers and local, state, and national policy advocacy groups, such as the Scholar Strategy Network, the State Innovation Exchange, and Utah legislators, to name a few. We also selected our first FPE policy intern from the Hinckley Institute at the University of Utah. Finally, we issued our second FPE policy brief in December and got to work revising our, pro our program budget. And this is uh, the wrap up. I'm Dave Turok. And I've been thinking this weekend in these extremely challenging times when there's so much indecency, it's rewarding to be able to treat people with dignity and respect and be part of this awesome team. And FPE is fostering that kind of dignity and respect in communities across Utah. We're fixing something that is fixable. Um, when any person can get any method of birth control they want without cost in a supportive and, and non-judgmental way, we all win. So hopefully you now have an idea of how flexible and collaborative we've been. But our real goal in sharing the first year of our journey with you has been to motivate and educate you about the opportunities and challenges available with this kind of work. And as far and away the oldest person in this group, um, I benefit from seeing the longest arc of progress in contraceptive access in Utah. About five years ago, I started on working on ways to right a simple wrong that I saw almost every day for many years as a doctor at the FQHCs here in Salt Lake City. I had had so many conversations with women who wanted a different or better method of birth control and couldn't access it especially because of finances. And the program's grown way beyond that now. But I do remember this particular day standing in the hallway at Central City Community Health Center on 400 East in downtown Salt Lake. I had just walked out of the 
room where I had placed an IUD for a patient of mine who I knew very well. Um, she had come way too close to dying uh, from an amniotic fluid embolism between the birth of twin A and twin B of hers. And we'd done some pretty unusual things to get her an IUD that she desperately wanted but couldn't afford. And I also remember standing in that hallway as I was about to walk in to the room to tell someone that I knew we weren't going to be able to get her an implant that she had wanted. I stood there in the hallway thinking, what does our community gain by not providing women and men the ability to best plan their families with the contraceptive methods they want? Why are we making it even harder for people with the greatest obstacles to achieving their hopes and dreams? What does society gain by making it harder? So at that moment in the hallway, at the CHCs, I committed to making contraceptive access better for everyone that I could in Utah. This is a fixable problem, which must make you think that it's a systems problem. And yesterday, I heard a story from one of my colleagues um, on labor and delivery here at the university, somebody who I started to work with at the CHCs over 20 years ago. She told me something that indicated that the system has shifted. She said, I have now actually taught myself not to discuss the cost of different contraceptive methods with my patients. It's made work way more fun and rewarding, but most importantly, my patients are happier and they get what they want. So even on this day with the biggest snowstorm of the year, the future is looking bright here in Salt Lake City. And we're looking forward to continuing to expand contraceptive services, do more trainings, more simulations, more advocating, and more sharing of our experiences and forthcoming rigorous results. Thank you very much, Rebecca Simmons uh, and the rest of the team with anyone who's interested and probably some people who aren't interested or maybe didn't know they were interested when we started talking. But mostly, we'll be doing more of whatever it takes to increase contraceptive access in Utah and wherever else we can help foster that. So we have a lot queued up for 2020. To start, FPE cap eligibility will shift beginning in March to 139 to 250% federal poverty for uninsured and underinsured clients and zero to 250 for undocumented clients. We will also begin reimbursing for contraceptive services for adolescents under 18 years old, abiding by parental consent laws. To start FPE, uh, this upcoming legislative session is going to be packed with legislation related to sexual and reproductive health care. Our pre-legislative policy brief will give you a heads up of what bills we are keeping an eye on. Our second annual contraceptive education and training conference is back and bigger than ever. There'll be two full days packed with new content and family planning expert speakers and trainers. Registration is now open and we recommend signing up as spots are going fast. Applications will open for our new Reproductive Justice Community Advisory Board in March and we're excited to support our founding board members and build off the momentum they've created. And this year we'll be partnering further with other contraceptive initiatives across the country to really start to figure out best practices for increasing contraceptive access and how do we best measure impact. We're really looking forward to seeing these conversations develop and expand. So we expect this year will be just as full of surprises and successes as last year, but are really looking forward to continuing this work. As we enter our terrific twos, we hope you'll stay tuned for what happens next. And we'll turn the time over now for questions. You can either type them in the chat box or use the raise your hand feature or just ask. Each member of our team is in the room, so if there's anything you'd like to direct to a specific person, just say so.
So the question is, um, can you share more about the total budget for the program? Yes, we can. Um, the total budget for the program, we got an initial grant from Arnold Ventures um, for $4 million to start the FPE process. And then we got another $2 million from an, the Anonymous Foundation um, for that. And then we also got pharmaceutical support uh, for devices. And the Dumkey uh, Foundation, which is a local foundation, provided us um, an additional million dollars to focus on um, contraceptive care in the Ogden area. So yeah, we've had a lot of diverse support. Um, another question that we've gotten is, can you share more about how you implement the proctoring for new learners? Um, do you pay the doctors? Um, do you mean, Mindy, are you talking about do we pay the doctors for the time proctoring or are you talking about like reimbursement in general? Ah, time proctoring. So I'll turn that over to Jessica lewis Capital. Hi there. So for our members in the FPE cap, there is not an additional charge for, for visits for me to come out there. Um, that is something that we work one-on-one, -on -one, um, especially depending on where your providers are in their skill set. So again, we start with initial training and then kind of work one-on-one -on -one to go out from there. So not, not additional charges. The next question is, um, uh, we're beginning our proposal plan planning process in Nashville, and I wonder why we might find a comprehensive list of outcome measures, both primary and process outcomes. Um, I find this a strength of your program and how it reflects your vision. Thank you so much for that. Um, we are doing a couple of things for you that could potentially direct you further. The first thing um, is that we have some of that documentation on the open science framework. So um, we can send out as part of our follow up the link to that, um, which gives our entire evaluation plan with some of those outcomes and how we're looking at them. And then both, uh, both for our FPE CAP program and for our process evaluation, we have papers um, in the process of being submitted that kind of detail our protocol for how we are collecting those in, that information and what the specific measures that we're taking um, goes into. Um, so the next question is, will you be sending out the legislative information um, in terms of like a link, uh, I'm sure about our particular outcome or maybe some policy? I'll let Jess answer that. So one of the things that we're doing with the policy related work um, is just ongoing engagement uh, within the state and at the state and local level, but also we are doing a pre and post legislative session um, policy snapshot, basically, that's giving some updates about what the current environment is, as well as bills that we're keeping an eye on. And we'll do the same thing after the legislative session. Um, one of the wonderful things that we get to do as an academic institution is really get to shed light and do a lot of education. Um, so we, we both work with policymakers broadly in the area of sexual and reproductive health um, and kind of proactive reproductive policy as well as keeping an eye on restrictive policy. Um, and then we also uh, frequently are reached out to about um, specific legislation and, and to try and give them some evidence-based um, insight into that. So there's a lot of variety in that. And I think that um, we'll try and share more of that as we do the policy snapshots, as well as some of the policy related evaluation pieces that are yet to come. Um, I'm so sorry. It looks like we skipped a message about um, provider bias. So let me find that. Okay. so. Can you share a, more about whether you've encountered provider bias in your work, and if so, how you've addressed this? I'm going to let Caitlin kind of talk to that. Yeah, so one of, um, one of the training sessions that we provide to all our FPE CAP sites is a person-centered contraceptive counseling training. Um, and central to this training is an exploration of, of personal bias, um, recognizing that we all, to some degree, have biases. and 
um, the first critical step is acknowledging what those are and, and doing that self-examination. Um, so we have several different exercises in the training to, to kind of go through that. Um, but also acknowledging that provider bias, it could be provider bias towards certain methods, um, but it could also be towards groups of people. And so really examining the, um, the history of reproductive coercion in this country and bringing that forefront to providers' minds as well is a, is a critical part of our training. Um, one thing that we're really looking forward to is, is not just the theoretical, but, but really seeing um, how things play out in practice. And that's part of why the family planning simulation sessions that we are, that Jamie and I have been planning, um, we really hope that those will address that to be able to, to really see are, are things happening um, that maybe we need to come in and, and, and massage and, and address. Great. And then there's a question um, about vasectomy. So say a little bit more about expanding vasectomy. Are you training providers in affiliated clinics to do vasectomies? And I'll let Dave talk about that. So as a former visit vasectomy provider at a FQHC, um, I also learned last week that um, there are providers who are actually filling their schedules now <laughs> with uh, a, you know, a full half day session of vasectomies where it really used to be um, much more sporadic. And um, it's, you know, there was an ongoing discussion at uh, the CHCs here in Salt Lake about, oh, you know, we provide care mostly to a uh, Latinx community and you know this isn't a popular thing and it turns out that when you remove costs all of a sudden it becomes a popular thing um, so uh, we are not providing training as of yet we are essentially covering um, trained providers who are doing some care and enabling them uh, to do more though we will include some vasectomy training in uh, the upcoming conference in June. So the next question is, um, what were the requirements to join your RJ committee and how were these people, uh, who were these people in your community and how is their input being used? And I will, um, I'll let Kyle kind of talk a little bit more about that um, to talk a little bit about how they're, how we selected the RJ. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great question. So we had um, pretty open requirements. We put out an application and we can, we can send that application. It was a Google form. We can send it to folks. Um, we let the leaders who had been talking to these RJ leaders in the community, we'd been meeting with them for months trying to dream up like what would this RJ cab look like. Um, and we wanted to make there be very few requirements um, to join because we didn't want people to feel like there would be educational requirements or different to a lot of other boards. We didn't want anybody to feel like they would have to contribute financially to the board in, in the opposite, we would be funding them. Um, so what our application was, was actually pretty broad and we just made a really explicit statement that we were looking for people who were people of color and we were not going to be discriminating on um, if they had had you know an incarceration history. Or, like We just really made it, um, very explicit that we were really wanting anybody to apply who felt like they um, wanted to contribute to a reproductive justice community advisory board. Um, and we, we sent an invitation, a flyer out to multiple people like the Promotoras, to Planned Parenthood, to community health workers, um, ACLU, YWCA, we just tried to send the flyer out to um, our community groups and ask people to share. Um, and, and then we selected everybody who applied. I think our application was more of, we were just wanting to make sure that no one was going to be a part of it that, um, that might be conflicting with the mission of RJCAB. And that will probably be, that may be a little bit different in this next one because there's more interest, but we would let the RJ leaders decide who, how, how big they want the board to be. Um, but their input is used in real time. Like for example, with our website, while we were designing it, the, the new one that's gonna be launched next month, we opened it up and they told us what they liked. They told us what they didn't like. And we in real time 
cut stuff that they didn't like. We, re we, we reworded stuff in a way that felt better to them. Um, so those kinds of examples. We have invited representatives from the Utah State Legislature to come to present on like uh, resolutions or bills that they are interested in running and get feedback from the RJ Cab, and it has resulted in um, some amendments being dramatically changed because it didn't resonate with the RJ Cab um, as a reproductive justice bill. Um, but this year it was mainly much more about what could we do to support them. Um, and this next year we're kind of working on goals that might be um, more geared towards FPE, but it was really about how do we support you in the, the things and the work that you're already doing and build trust and help compensate them for their hard work that they're already doing. Oh, that is great. <laughs> no, that's great. The next question is, um, you acknowledged that a lesson learned was that you needed to move away from the reduction of unintended pregnancy as the measure of success, but we're still re relying on the data points you had. Could you share more about what you used beyond the reduction of unintended pregnancy? Yeah, so um, part of the decision around moving away from unintended pregnancy did come from our own data where we were looking at how unintended pregnancy changed in our her cohort um, over time and essentially you know, our, our, our colleague, um, Claudia Geist, has published on this, uh, pregnancy intentions are changing and they tend to change in response to different circumstances. Um, so as we've thought a little bit more deeply about what we really wanted to get at, this focus of contraceptive access became more um, theoretically focused around the things that have been demonstrated to improve access. So. Um, aspects of geography and availability of methods and um, quality of care and things that are a little bit more health systems focused. Um, this idea that if we can support those health systems um, and really look at the measures of the health of the system rather than the health, you know, this perceived measure of health of um, individuals that we would be a little bit more on the right track. I do want to say that we don't feel like we have you know, the, all of the answers at this point, and we are collaborating with um, different folks in different contraceptive initiatives, you might be one of them, um, about how we want to standardize measures for contraceptive initiatives moving forward. Um, and we're, we're really looking forward to kind of sharing those, those conversations and trying to think through further about that. So, um, does anybody have anything else that they would like to ask, either through a raise of hands or typing it into the chat function? Or just saying it out loud, that's also fine. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll leave it open for a while, but while we're, we're doing that, um, I think one thing that our team, oh, do you have a way to evaluate your media campaign? Yes, um, one of the ways we have three different ways that we are evaluating our media campaign. Um, some of it is through analytics. So we have a, a paper that will be shortly forthcoming about our evaluation of our HER media campaign. And the lessons learned from that HER media campaign have really informed the way that we're approaching the current FPE media campaign. Um, but some of that data involves some analytic metrics um, and some indicators of success through our analytics, but then also looking at the demand generation that we see at the clinic level. So we've incorporated some questions about, or we will once our media campaign gets up and running, um, we're currently testing some media questions to be incorporated into our client exit surveys, um, looking at whether people recognize these different images, whether they can give us the messaging that's associated with our campaign um, and, and kind of associating at that level. And then um, we've had some communications with our partner or BWP partner about other options for measuring um, visibility of that campaign. So uh, we're, we're still finalizing some of those measures, but that's our original plan. Um, a next question is, thank you so much. Have you used patient satisfaction surveys to gauge patient confidence, shared decision making, et cetera? Any data collection about patient attitudes, beliefs, confidence in different methods after, after education? Yeah, so we are doing, um, like I just mentioned, some client exit surveys and the client exit surveys that we have right now are, um, they have 
12 measures of provider encounter, um, and that's around education, um, feelings of quality, feelings of being heard, provider bias. And then we also have a couple of measures around uh, interaction with the clinic staff as well. Um, and then feelings about whether or not they got the method that they wanted, whether or not they felt like they could switch or stop methods when they wanted. Um, so we have, we are looking at some of that data at the clinic level. Um, uh, but again, some of this, you know, is still ongoing. Um, follow up to the budget question, was the roughly $8 million for two years or longer? Also, are all of your staff team members full time on this project? Who on your team is supporting partners to strengthen service delivery structures, including EHR workflow, maximizing billing and reimbursement, and supporting practice management to schedule for the same day? Um, I'm going to turn this over to Kyle to give you a, a thorough answer on that one. That's a fantastic question. Uh, questions that I think we were trying to think about when we were also designing this and that we're still finding answers for probably. Um, so on the budget, the, the roughly $8 million was what we anticipated we might need for three years, um, including everything from personnel and FPE cap and our media campaign. Um, that is not the case anymore, um, but, but that was our, our goal, right? And like in the very beginning, before you're doing this, before you actually know who your partners are, before you actually know what their clinic volume is, before you know what, they're reimbursed, when the, what the, um, the rates are that they are buying methods, um, we just, we didn't know. So when we had to uh, kind of design our budget, we were taking some, some lessons learned from her Salt Lake and then trying to look at what were 340B rates, what were device rates, um, and then what kind of cash grant did we want to give people. Um, so we're actually right now completely revamping our budget based off of our first year of actual expenses and all of these things that came up that we had to pivot with. So um, for example, like we didn't anticipate needing a customized data system that is costing money, um, which is fantastic, but not something that was in our original budget. Um, and, you know, ch even just the change in when it was $50 for a Lyleta device, it's changing dramatically now, that, like the, the entire program budget when it changes to $100 a device. So all of these little things we're having to revisit annually um, throughout because this is this program is definitely costing more than eight million dollars, and we are hoping to be able to extend it. We don't we don't want to have to stop it at three years. So development is a huge part of what we're doing um, all the time. Who on our team is supporting partners to strengthen service delivery structures, including EHR workflow, maximize billing reimbursement, and supporting practice management to schedule for same day, et cetera? We would have. We have specific people on our team. So for example, Alex Giro works really closely with the people who are in the EHR um, on like the, the claim side. And we're also working really closely with the COOs at these um, different partner clinics and the MA leads to try to figure out how we can optimize the way they are coding um, to be able to maximize billing reimbursement. We also call on experts like NIFRA and other other organizations to help us where we don't have the experience and they they do. So we do work with a lot of other people who have figured this out. Um, as far as supporting practice management to schedule for same day, uh, we really do try to figure out um, who those clients are and what seems to be the gaps. Like, is this just they don't have providers there? Do Are they already overbooked? Um, but also making sure like, is same day the most appropriate thing? Like sometimes, yes it is. And we need to be making sure someone gets the same day IUD. Um, but sometimes they want some time to think about it and they wanna go back and talk to their partner. And we also wanna be supporting that and not mandating a requirement that same day has to be happening um, or else. So I hope that answers your question, Katie. And then Teresa has a question. Do you anticipate always needing to subsidize devices? Uh, no, we do not want to always subsidize devices. Really what we were hoping to do with our FPE cap program was help these <coughs> clinics for two years, really hands-on, really customized, really taking the edge off of these like bottom line things that are making it so they can't um, they can't afford to get devices in and just helping them with that cushion and then really supporting them through these 
at least two years for them to, to realize how important and critical it is to have comprehensive contraceptive care in their primary care setting. So the, the goal, of course, is that when we leave, um, that Medicaid is already coming in. And so if we don't have to subsidize these devices because Medicaid is reimbursing for them. Um, so that's kind of the hope is that what FPE is, you know, I, I joke that, well, we're Medicaid until Medicaid is Medicaid, but that is the goal. And we might need to subsidize devices for undocumented individuals until something happens there. Um, but the goal is to really move the dial on publicly funded ways to be able to reimburse fully for comprehensive contraceptive care um, and, and not them having to rely on FPE. The whole thing is trying to get them to not rely on FPE and to be able to have this into their clinic workflow. I just wanted to give a shout out of gratitude to um, our pharmaceutical partners at um, Bayer, Cooper Surgical, and Merck, uh, who have been absolutely fabulous in giving us longer legs um, to extend uh, their products to people. Absolutely. Are there more questions? So there's some more, um, some more options for folks to ask questions if you have them. Um, if you would like, uh, we'll give it a couple more minutes if you've got something pressing or if something occurs to you. Um, while we're waiting, um, I just do want to take, I think everybody here in this room is super grateful to um, Maddie Mulholland for the amazing, amazing slide presentations that she puts together. Um, she's truly amazing and, and has put so much effort into making this beautiful and, and smooth. So just a deep appreciation. Oh, thanks, Mandy. <laughs> I also want to just note that if you think of something later and you would like to, you know, reach out, feel free to contact our team. Um, we would love to talk more about this. I feel like we could talk about this for hours. Um, so definitely feel free to email us any uh, residual questions that you might have. Um, mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> yeah. I like this question, Beth. So, the, the question that we've heard some advantages to the fact that your project is run out of an academic institution. Have you found any drawbacks to this backbone structure? Yes, we <laughs> have. Uh, so I do want to say that it is, it is great to be in a university structure that already has so much trust and great rapport in the community. And of course, we're in this OBGYN department and in a family planning division. And so we already had some some ability to be able to like maybe pull you know from staff who were already doing things. Um, the the bureaucracy of being within a university, like the time frame that it works, because there are so many hoops to jump through before a contract can be fully executed, before a paycheck can get cut, um, and bef it, it is really really challenging sometimes to be in an academic institution, and I wonder what it would be like sometimes you know if we were if we weren't but but i don't know i don't know for for us if it would um if it would be better for us to be kind of like on our own there is a huge advantage in being in an academic institution especially a teaching hospital because our liability coverage for our providers just follows them like this beautiful umbrella into our into our clinics where we partner with and we we wouldn't have that same thing right so um, nurse Jessica, her Dr. Jessica, her um, her liability of, will will transfer when she is traveling to these county health departments and these FQHCs, and we do know that that could that would have been a really big barrier for us if we weren't within this academic institution. Um, but but yes, there are there are different things, right? Like we have to be really mindful about how we're representing the university um, with our messaging, with the who we're partnering with, how we talk about things. But I don't know that it is um, a fatal drawback or one that I that I wish we didn't necessarily have. But it is a it can be a challenge. 
And I just want to add one thing about the policy piece because, you know, with, with this work, we really are trying to promote evidence-based policy. Um, and one of the limitations is at an academic institution, you really can't advocate for specific legislation. And so we have developed really wonderful relationships with our government, government affairs office and our general counsel um, to make sure that we are appropriate in how we are educating policymakers um, and kind of walking that line of what kind of things we end up needing to do in our <coughs> personal time versus what we can do as a program um, and as part of the university. And I think that that's been a really, like a, I mean, it's, it's been a huge learning curve, um, but it's totally doable. And I think that because we are trying our best to really follow, um, you know, follow along and, and do what's right, um, those relationships have only strengthened the, the program and, and hopefully the program's impact in the long run. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's not to say that you can't run a contraceptive initiative without an academic institution. So I think that's really, yeah, <laughs> you can run it from anywhere. Mm -hmm. But maybe partnering with an academic institution to help with the evaluative things, or maybe partnering with a, an academic institution who has clinicians who could be, you know, you could help, you know, contribute to their funding through the academic institution, but just for the the sheer miracle that is their liability to be able to follow them. Oh, Gabby, that's a really good question. <laughs> Where does Family Planning Elevated see itself in five years? It's such a good question, and I hope that you have seen from this webinar that we thought we were going to be in a really different place today, uh, you know, last year, that it's just so much of this is really dynamic. Um, the, the, the big goal with Family Planning Elevated is that in Utah, there is really incredible health care coverage and that people are not falling into the contraceptive coverage gap because they're not falling into any health insurance coverage gap. So that would be um, the goal. Are we going to get there? I don't, I don't know if we're going to get there. Medicaid, as you've seen, has been a yo-yo that has just yanked our hearts around all year long, uh, but, we, but we've had some wins. There have been some wins that make what we are moving towards easier and more um, within our reach. And so I like to think, I mean, I think that we'll still be here, but I love to think that things are starting to wrap up and that we get to kind of pivot in what we're doing and we're providing continuing, continued education places and we're not having to um, pull new clinics up from kind of the ground because they aren't even doing contraceptive care. The hope is that every FQHC and county health department um, and community clinic where people who are typically underserved uh, are able to get comprehensive contraceptive care. Yeah, so I think we're still gonna be here. I hope we're still going to be here, but I hope that we're doing really different things. Anyone else wanna mention anything? No, I think that's, that's pretty, I mean, heads are all nodding around our table, so. <laughs> um, yeah, anything else that you guys would like to hear from us on, or we can open our, open our jackets for this on, in a show, show the. Yeah, what would you guys like for the next year's webinar? That would be a question we have for you. If you feel like typing something in, letting us know, it'd be helpful. Yes. Yeah. Everything right. No one we didn't get the kids that were present. Thanks for taking Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, everybody. Really appreciate it. Um one question. Uh 
on the plug. Yeah, so a plug for people to join in the private Facebook group and keep learning. So that's an excellent uh, link. So hopefully all of the folks who are joined here now can kind of plug into that. And we definitely will be looking into that further. Thank you, Mindy. Um, Katie's saying, with your annual conference, who are your target participants, given that you identified it wasn't the best venue for training and onboarding CAP cohort members? Um, I can say a little bit about this, and then I'm sure Kyle or, or, or others can provide um, some follow-up. Um, we, there are search, we are working with FPE CAP at a clinic level, trying to do a holistic support for contraceptive access, understanding that that means, you know, administrators and support staff, as well as clinicians. Um, and while it doesn't necessarily work to do a full um, onboarding for each clinic at a large contraceptive education and training conference, we are certainly hoping to provide that same idea of support across different staff levels and for different people um, around contraceptive access. So people who this new conference, this upcoming conference is really for folks who are interested in that vision, um, but who maybe aren't our FPE CAP members or who maybe are our FPE CAP members and want to kind of get that underscored a little bit further. So we have an offering at our CETC for pharmaceutical folks who are doing dispensing of contraceptives. We're, we're trying to make offerings for more simulation training for different clinics for, you know, contraceptive education and training. We're trying to give all of the different um, clinical skills updates that you might need, including postpartum IUDs, IUDs insertions, implant insertions and removals, um, all of the different and vasectomy training. Um, we're really trying to expand for those folks who maybe want more from contraceptive access, but who don't have a venue to get that in Utah um, or elsewhere, we're trying to be that venue. We have stuff for MAs, we have stuff for administrators. Um, we are really trying to make this a whole team effort and to encourage people who want to be part of that team to come and learn from us. So, <laughs> great. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody, for joining, for all of your amazing questions. Um, like I said, if you have anything that occurs to you later, feel free to email us. We would love to talk further um, and hope to hear from you. And like Mindy was saying, feel free to join that Facebook access uh, group, and that would be a lovely place to continue this discussion as well. Um, thank you, everybody. Bye. 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 Take care. Bye.